This is Burn This Book, a banned books book club where we, Nicole and Eden, read a banned or challenged book twice a month and discuss its meaning, impact, and censorship to make it more accessible for all readers. This week's book is The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton, which was published in 1967 when the author was 18 years old. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about that. I have a lot of thoughts about it, too. <laughs> um, my summary, I'm going to yes. do in the form of a song. The song goes, okay. boy, boy, crazy, crazy boy, boy. Be, be cool, cool boy. boy. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the book. Uh, so the book is about these two feuding gangs, which are actually, interestingly enough, not racially motivated, but economically. It's all mm-hmm. about social class. But there are these two feuding gangs in this high school, the Soches versus the Greasers. It just, it gets out of hand. Mm -hmm. If you've watched West Side Story. It's pretty much West Side Story. It's pretty much West Side Story. Um, There isn't the whole Romeo and Juliet thing, though, sadly. No, Um, no romance. And it it comes from the perspective of this 14-year-old, I think he's 14? Mm -hmm. Pony boy? 12 or 14, he's young. He's a very sensitive boy. He's very well-rounded and thoughtful, and he loves movies. He loves reading. He loves drawing, and he, he's a very deep thinker. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of like a journal entry of what happened in one week of his life. And he's a greaser, and um, little background, his name is Ponyboy. He has a brother named Soda Pop, and another brother named Daryl, who goes by Dairy. Dally. No, Dally's oh, wait. The oh, Dally's friend. the other one. Yeah. Sorry. And, gosh, Ina. No, I got confused about that the whole time. Their parents had just died very recently, and they had like a very intact family unit, very loving rodeo family kind of vibes. Then when their parents died, the older brother kind of took over, didn't go to college. And so they were kind of living in poverty, doing the best they can, but very much taking care of each other. Fights break out between them and the Soches and their little gang of friends, and it gets really violent to the point where two people end up dying. Three people end up dying. Spoilers. Mm-hmm. Three people die, and, um, and yeah, it's just, it's horrible to you. It's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. Um, actually, I love the book, though. I I'd never read it because I was always like, "Ugh, I've already I know this story. I've seen <laughs> oh, this is movies. your first time. This was my first time reading it. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, I even I put it off. I even tried to do like an audiobook version of it last year when I knew it was on the banned book list, mm-hmm. and the narrator was so annoying. And I was like, "There's no way I'll be able to read it visually because I don't have the attention span." That's what I told <laughs> myself because I was like, "This is going to be such a 1960s." ragtag book oh my goodness i loved it it's so good it's yeah this is so good this was my second time reading it first time was in high school and uh a lot of it came back it's a very simple story yeah a lot of it came back but there was something like really visceral about pony boy cutting his hair and dyeing it blonde that like i can't describe the feeling It, it felt like a nostalgic feeling, but I don't remember why. <laughs> it's like, yeah. wait, did something about him cutting his hair and dying? Well, and I don't remember if I've seen the movie either. I haven't seen the movie. So that's something we should talk about too. It's a Francis Ford Coppola movie. Mm-hmm. Or Coppola. I don't know how you want to say it. Um, and it stars everyone. Everyone. Um, it stars Tom Cruise, Emilio Estevez. Uh, Matt Dillon, Patrick Swayze, mm-hmm. Rob Lowe. Who am I missing? Um, other, oh, Flea from Red Hot Chili Peppers is in it as oh, a yeah. coach <laughs> randomly. And I have it like, I wrote this down because I was like, this is the most bizarre cast list I've ever seen. It's everyone who's, everyone who's any of them. Nicholas Cage is in it, and hockey star Cam Neely. They all play like socials, so they're not really huge parts, but they're like it's just a bizarre, bizarre cast. Oh, and Ralph Macchio. I don't know who that is. I only know Karate Kid. Oh, and I think he plays Johnny. Oh, it really reminded me of Catcher in the Rye, to be honest, and Mm. Perks of Being a Wallflower. Yeah, all about these boys who just did not totally understand, and they're writing their own experiences to someone nebulous. Um, yes, this book, 
he's writing it to his teacher because after his best friend dies and another guy from their gang, uh, Dallas dies, he's just jaded and he's really going through the grieving process. Very, very well done. He's like failing all Mm -hmm. of his classes and he used to be a star student, pony boy. And he used to be like a star track star, like a star athlete too at the school. And he like really was great and he's failing everything, despondent, doesn't care. His teacher finally is like, hey, why don't you tell me, just write about a theme about something. And Ponyboy decides to write about what happened. And that's mm-hmm. what this whole book is, just that narrative. Just like in Perks of Being Wallflower and Catcher in the Rye. Like, it is, yeah. And I loved it. Yeah. Ah, I, give um, me more straight yeah. <laughs> white teenage boys writing about depression. <laughs> Well, the Give thing is, that. like, P-O-B. <laughs> left and right, yeah. on the heels of, like, looking for Alaska and me, Earl, and the dying girl, this felt very wholesome. Mm-hmm. The more modern books that we've read for this podcast, they are a bit misogynistic uh, when they talk yeah. about girls. And granted, yes. this this book, uh, Essie Hinton, talk about sexism, like, ingrained sexism. I thought Essie Hinton was a man who wrote this but Essie Hinton is she was a girl when she wrote this she started yeah. writing it when she was 16 and the reason why she wanted to write it was because she wanted to feel more empathy towards the the more outsider groups of her school who are the greasers she sees like in her own school the conflict between like upper class and lower class and how they fight and stuff like that And I thought that was really beautiful that she's like, you know what, I'm going to write about this. I'm going to write about this conflict from their perspective. Like, why, why do they act like this? Like, maybe she had, maybe she was kind of like a cherry, one of the girls in in the book who had a good connection with a greaser and was like, wait, like, you're really smart. And you're really like, you do really well in school. Like, why are you Mm. like this? And blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's interesting. So I think maybe also why Cherry is such a great female character is probably because the author is female. (laughs) Seriously, and the way, so so the story goes through and Ponyboy is just living his life, doing his thing. He goes to movies, he goes, sees him alone. He has a lot of issues with his older brother. He feels like his older brother, Derry, is really controlling and he just feels like he's misunderstood. And the only Mm -hmm. people that understand him are his middle brother, Soda Pop, and then his best friend, Johnny. And so Ponyboy is kind of just living through that space and randomly him and Johnny are hanging out at this thing and they, they meet these like social girls and one of them is named Cherry mm-hmm. and her boyfriend, who's like the head of the socials gang, they are drunk and they like ditch them, ditch the girls and Cherry and her friend start talking to Johnny and Ponyboy and they have like a really beautiful conversation where they do, yeah. Ponyboy explains that they like greasers just feel too much. They're mm-hmm. always emotional, and she explains socials don't feel anything. Mm-hmm. But just because they're privileged and have all this money and all these opportunities doesn't mean that they're better off than the greasers because they don't feel anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it's like it's such an interesting. It's just yeah. So Cherry ends up becoming like this this interesting bridge between them and a part of the humanity. And Pony Boy never once objectifies her. He just says, like, she's beautiful and she's kind and she thinks and she he could talk to her about sunsets and yeah. sunrises. He's like, I know she'd understand, whereas other people don't. And it's so tender because, like, and he also knows, and she even says at one point that she would fall in love with Dallas, who's uh, part of the greaser gang, if she was around him too much because he's so, like, troubled and such a leader and such a bad boy. And she's like, that's why I can't hang out with him. Like, she's very self-aware. and yeah. And I just thought, yeah, she was, never did we talk about her breasts. Mm -mm. Never did we have to have, like, some sort of, like, sexual exploration for Ponyboy in order for him to understand humanity. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm, like, kind of getting tired of that narrative. Yeah. I'm sorry, everyone, but (laughs) it's like, okay, now we're going to go to this weird place for this teenage boy. But, like, he just, he was able to understand love and understand how to respect her without objectifying her first. Like, he didn't have to go Mm -hmm. through that barrier. Um, I also think it's because he he is a reader too. Like from the very beginning, he's like quoting books. He's like, "Oh, I feel like Pip from Great Expectations." Yeah, yeah, he did quote that. 
Um, and like the the main thing that's like the the most popular quote to come from the outsiders is "Stay gold, pony boy," mm-hmm. which is which is a line from a Robert Frost poem. And so when Pony Boy and Johnny got, get into a fight with the Soches, um, and they end up, well, Johnny, out of self defense, and ends up killing one of them <clears throat> because they were trying to drown Pony Boy in a fountain. Mm-hmm. Ugh, boys, I know. Um, <laughs> and Johnny kills Cherry's boyfriend. Oh, was that Cherry's boyfriend? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so she he kills Cherry's boyfriend, and then they're like, "Oh shoot, we gotta <laughs> run!" So they run. Yeah. But one of the things that like Johnny goes out to get some food and like hair dye and to change their appearance and stuff like that, and he also get, brings a book. And he brings Gone with the Wind, and so like scattered throughout this whole book are are just literature. It's just mm-hmm. the emphasis on, and maybe that's why like Pony Boy is able to. And you're, like be more empathetic and deep, have deeper conversations with the people around him because he is reading. And so yeah. this book is like an ode to reading too. Yeah. I feel like. Yeah. yeah. I also think Pony Boy's family, like when they, when everyone talks about Pony Boy's mom who passed, mm-hmm. everyone talks about her in such a, a reverent way. Like she was so wonderful. And even when Pony Boy describes her, he describes her as always golden. Yeah, throughout the thing, and I think this speaks to what you're saying. Ponyboy had a really strong sense of morals, like he mm-hmm. knew good from bad. He didn't like Soda Pop's friend Steve. Uh-huh. Um, Steve seemed to be like really violent and would objectify people, or was just like really interested in alcohol. Dallas, uh, Ponyboy saw Dallas as like very multidimensional, but very sad. Dallas had come from like mm-hmm. New York City, where he was involved in other gangs and had a really big record with the police. And Ponyboy knew that Dallas was proud of that, but he also was like Dallas is trouble. And yeah. the only person Dallas loves is Johnny. Like, John, he really takes care of Johnny. Ponyboy is able to see these people and recognize, like, that's not great. That's good. And he also gives people space. Like, someone mm-hmm. from the Soches shows up to talk to them after they accidentally kill the Bob. Mm-hmm. And Randy from the Soches. And Ponyboy gives him time to talk about what he's feeling and, like, sees him as a person. Yeah. Like, he's so introspective and so compassionate with how he looks, even though he thinks that the system that they're working in is so ridiculous. And I think it's probably because of all the books he's read. Like, yeah. He's able, he has that muscle really finely tuned. Like he just quotes Robert Frost to Johnny when they're hiding out in the church. Yeah. Like, really just nilly. like looking at a sunrise or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, nothing gold can stay. And then Johnny on his deathbed says, stay gold, Tony boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's so sweet. It is such a sweet book. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness! <laughs> are you going to name your son Pony Boy now? Uh, I really like Soda Pop. <laughs> I've been really leaning towards Soda Pop. Could you imagine, like, hey, I want to name my kids Daryl, Pony Boy, and Soda Pop? <laughs> like, poor Daryl, I- like not fitting in. <laughs> Just- <laughs> It's confusing because, well, it's an interesting choice because they never explain why they're named Soda Pop and Pony Boy. And Mm -hmm. um, they set us up for that explanation multiple times because someone's like, your name's really Pony Boy? Like when Cherry first meets Pony Boy, she's like, your name's Pony Boy? Um, But she also doesn't like judge it or question it. She's very respectful. And she's like, that's an interesting name. But other Mm -hmm. people are really judgy about it, like the police and the school teacher who they mm-hmm. meet later on, like all these different characters come in and are like very much like, whoa, you guys are freaks. Um, and it's their legal names, but they never explain it. And it feels like the explanation has died with their parents. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. Pony Boy doesn't know either why he was named Pony Boy. Yeah. So that's an interesting, like we don't get, we're not privy to that either. We also have a sense of loss because like we'll never know because their parents died. Yeah. It reminds me of looking for Alaska, where they kind of give each other fake, fake nicknames, and so like <laughs> I have like more respect for pon- Pony Boy and Soda Pop. It's like, oh, that's their legal name. <laughs> it's like, whereas the General and Pudge, okay, okay, <laughs> okay, someone's pretentious. Like <laughs> the General, I will never get over that. But you know what? It really worked for some people. Mm-hmm. I got called out for calling a book stupid once, so I'm trying really hard um, to like not call out books. But some books are better than others. That's all I'm gonna say. Yep. Um, <laughs> uh, for me, for me, some books are just mm-hmm. not for me. So 
it's Essie Hinton. Her name is Susan Eloise. And um, she's credited with introducing the young adult genre. Oh, yeah. I was reading that. And there's a New Yorker article by John McCloud, I think, from 2014. And it's called Essie Hinton and the Young Adult um, Debate. And the whole crux is, should there be a separate um, industry for, or a separate, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Separate category for young adults or, you know, and so like mm-hmm. trying to figure out how do we market that? How do we choose that? What do we say? Like, how, do, and I think this is the question we have with banning books. A lot of these books, yeah. are they young adult? Are they like, what, where does that cut off meet? Mm-hmm. And as young adults are getting as we're progressing as a society does do those you know what i'm saying do yeah those, <laughs> do those markers change how we uh-huh. rate things do they change um i don't know so this one person her name is ruth graham she's a critic she published an article in slate saying that adults should feel embarrassed about reading literature for children saying that young adult literature should just be for young adults where a, and that reference keeps changing. So should adults be reading The Outsiders? Should we be crossing those invisible... Bar- I just think that's gatekeeping, personally, and I think it's ridiculous. Yeah, Precision a really strong is- statement. Is mis- <laughs> is- adults should be embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. Um, And I think it's the thing where, like, if you like it, you should read it. I don't know. Yeah. But- well, that's like... Uh, yeah, that is such a strong statement. So that's like... Mm-hmm. Implying that if Harry Potter, when Harry Potter came out and you were an adult, you should be embarrassed that you read Harry Potter. Yeah. <laughs> the, exactly. That's just bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And in this New Yorker article, the journalist points out that all the books in The Outsiders are technically for adults. Gone with the Wind mm. is quoted, um, Great Expectations, um, The Haunting of Hill House. And yet somehow, but like, but they're still being read by these teenagers. So like, how do you, what do you do with that? Yeah. <laughs> Where are you supposed to go with that? And I, just, I think it's a, a silly conversation, to be honest, but it is a conversation that has been swirling around Essie Hinton because she is the reason why certain books are considered young adults. Yeah. That is interesting. Well, yeah. yeah like before Essie Hinton, then, then all the books that kids read in school were adult books. Yeah. They didn't, or I just don't think they were, they were delineating it. Is that a word? Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Oh, just expose kids to good literature. (laughs) But they're like, no, that's too hard. (laughs) That's too hard. (laughs) That's too hard. Um, So what a really interesting um, 17, 18 year old girl. I just don't, I want to be about her. Yeah. And she's very she, private, though, apparently. Ugh, come on. She was 14 when she started writing the book. So it took about three and a half-ish years to write it. Mm-hmm. And then her, her publisher actually was the one who told her to initialize her first two names because it's so feminine. Susan oh Eloise. In, in order to get past the male... Speaking of gatekeeping... Uh, get past the male gatekeeping publishers yeah. and reviewers, which was super interesting. She actually ended up liking that because she ended up just separating her public and private life with with the initials. That's smart. That makes sense, especially because um, Outsiders is from first person perspective, mm-hmm. and I think and it's a lot of like Pony Boy's thoughts. And I'm sure people would credit Pony Boy's thoughts or her thoughts because she was such a young writer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure readers and cr- critics of the past would be like see if she was so you know she's so young these must just be her thoughts like there's no way this is all original and like come out as for this character for this specific character um mm-hmm. which is not fair but I feel like people do that to women all the time they're like they can't tell I think stories so. they yeah. can <laughs> diary journal entries um uh-huh. people do that with taylor swift and i'm not like i'm not a taylor swift apologist or diehard at all but people do that with her work where it's very much like her lyrics are i have to be um first person like they have to be autobiographical because no like she's not smart enough to tell like a, a real story like 
other lyricists, you know, which is so ridiculous, but that is so ridiculous. Yeah. That is part of the conversation. So people read into every single thing that she writes, whether it's true or not. Yeah. As if it's her real life. So that's interesting. Um, that is super interesting. And it it kind of like ties back to the gatekeeping conversation of just like, oh, well, technically, you could say this is a YA novel, too, because she wrote it as a young adult. <laughs> yeah. And so like, should the adults who are writing YA novels be embarrassed by that? I know. I don't I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone should be embarrassed for what they put out in the world. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I do think it is interesting because I guess also she, when she first published it, it was supposed to be, it was marketed towards adults and uh-huh. it, like as like a drugstore counter book and it like didn't go anywhere. It wasn't, as, it wasn't successful at all. And I don't know, maybe you do know this, how it went from that to being marketed to, to young adults because if we're looking at the timing also, we also have Judy Bloom coming out with her work just like in the next five years, mm-hmm. all these books tailored to young girls. So I'm curious where that age separation is, like where that cutoff is. Dear God, it's me, Margaret. Is that? That's considered like a, there's a term for it. And this is probably a larger conversation that we could do on like an episode of where we like explain this rating system because I don't understand it. And I think just full disclosure, and I think that would be helpful for people to understand Mm -hmm. it. And maybe we could provide those resources because to me, the outsiders was like, it had gang violence and drug use, Uh Um, but it wasn't, it had no graphic sexuality. It had, it didn't have like crass profanity. It was profane, but like, I felt like it was necessary. Nothing like me, Earl, and the no, dying nothing girl. Nothing like or... me, Earl, and the dying girl. And I also feel like its themes were so universal that mm-hmm. I I feel like it should be graded lower. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> than the other ones, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's strange to, to yeah, like I said earlier, to read this on the heels of m- more modern YA novels. Yeah. I don't know. From from what I saw in Greece, I feel like <laughs> right, right. Greece rebel without a cause. You know, yeah. teens have always been teens, and um, maybe because Essie Hinton is a girl and wasn't as profane as her male counterparts, um, that we had like such a teen book. But then, like Catcher in the Rye, Catcher in the Rye was relatively tame compared to mm-hmm. all the modern stuff too it's just a shift of like what we allow in modern yeah in modern times i guess but then it, that's also funny because the movies what was pg-13 back then is considered r now yeah i don't understand these rating systems at all and I want to sit down with every editor of all these different modern books to talk mm-hmm. about why what yeah why they did this part or why that part was important in telling the story. Because for me, I felt like this story, the emotional uh, journey I went on with Pony Boy was, mm-hmm. it was incredible. I was yeah. so moved by where he was at the beginning. And it's just in the span of one week to his despondence, anger, willingness to fight and get violent mm-hmm. um, by the middle of the week. And then the very end of him, like kind of realizing but he can't do that. He needs to he needs to stay gold. He needs to care about sunsets. He needs to care about people. He needs to do these things. But like the emotional journey I went on was so beautiful. <laughs> like it was yeah. such beautiful storytelling. Nothing distracted from it. I felt so in it the entire time. And mm-hmm. I sometimes feel like more modern books, we choose parts to shock and awe that it almost pulls me out. And then I have to go back in. And yeah reconcile like in um the look just felt like it felt like I was watching a Josh Schwartz show which we love but it did feel (laughs) like at points I was like this isn't I'm not getting like I feel like we we leaned on that more than we leaned on the emotional ramifications of someone's friend dying 
and yeah. what that would do to the person and relationships and all those things, you know? And mm-hmm. I don't feel like we missed any of that in The Outsiders. I feel like I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is a group mm-hmm. of people with a lot of trauma I'm trying to figure this out. And they are explaining it very well. Very and well, yeah. Very well. And what a great novel to to bring empathy to both sides of the socioeconomic oh, uh, gosh. Yeah. range. Yeah. Gradient. Um, yeah. Because like you can see that basically like people don't have, they just don't have parents who care for them in a way that matters or they don't have parents at all. Like even like Johnny, who's the sweetest boy in the world, like his parents are terrible. They're like, oh, yeah. like, well, what did you do this time to make us look bad? And, like oh. Cherry, Cherry bringing the empathy for the socias as well. of just like, oh, there's something wrong in their lives that they don't feel anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just read a book called uh, that I think like every parent should read. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? It's called Never Enough, uh, and it's about accomplishment culture in the United States. Mm-hmm. It's mostly geared towards uh, families with means and who want to like give their kids everything. Mm-hmm. But that puts their child in a in a state of constant stress, academic pressure, and all of that, and people often put like pain on a scale it's like oh like if you look at it objectively the greasers pain or not objectively but if you look at it it looks like the greasers mm-hmm. pain is worse than the socius pains mm-hmm. um but one one quote that i got from this book is uh, a child in pain is a child in pain it doesn't matter like what type of pain pain comes in all shapes and sizes uh, it comes if you're super wealthy, if you're super poor, and it looks different, but the person yeah. who is pained is affected and and it can affect in similar ways where you create gangs and you go to rumbles. I love that point. I think um, it forces, because I want to choose a side, obviously, I want to be like, Greece is better than the socials. <laughs> um, but bottom line is that both sides are multidimensional and have a lot of issues. Cherry at one point tells Pony Boy about the guy who Johnny accidentally kills in self defense. She explains that Bob is a person who's never been told no. And he's mm-hmm. doing everything he can just to be told no by his parents, but his parents will never tell him no. So you see how like wealth and privilege is like just rotted him. And there's this part after everything is said and done. And Johnny has died, and Dally has died, Bob is dead, and the court hearing is about to happen about the murder. And Ponyboy is looking at a yearbook, and he looks at Bob's picture, and really looks at Bob's picture, and looks at him as a person instead of, like, the leader of the socias. And he looks at him and thinks about how he was Cherry's boyfriend, and why did Cherry like him? If Cherry likes sunrises and sunsets and all that. Why would she like Bob? Um, mm-hmm. And kind of has, like, a, a little bit of a psychotic break where he starts telling everyone that he's the one that killed Bob. Johnny didn't do it in an effort to, to believe that Johnny's still alive. Mm -hmm. To the point where he even like tells like Randy, the so she's like, no, I killed Bob. And they don't want him to to give testimony because he's not, he's not mentally well. He's in a place of like denial and a lot of confusion. And he knows that he's in denial and he knows why he's doing it. But he, he looks at Bob's picture and like really leans into the fact that Bob was just a kid. And Mm -hmm. that part, it's so, to me, it reminded me so much of Perks of being a wallflower because at the end of Perks, Charlie thinks about his aunt who had abused him and is like, well, she was abused too. And that person was abused too. Like, where does the buck stop in blaming people? At Mm -hmm. what point are we just all broken people and we just have to move forward? And he's like, I don't, like, I'm not, I'm not like happy that happened. I don't forgive my aunt. I, but I'm letting it go. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's like a very multidimensional, really compassionate, really healthy way of looking at issues. Yeah. Um, And it takes a a lot of us a long time to get there. And it usually includes therapy. But Pony Boy does it too, where he's like, Bob was just a kid too. It's these systems Mm -hmm. that are bad. All of us are trying our best and it's really messy. Yeah. And that's like where he gets and you get all these like reflections from him at the end. And it's, it's very perks being wallflower. And I loved that. 
I love mm-hmm. seeing them and walking through how they're coping and getting to a healthy place mentally in order to move forward. Cause it was just a good example to me. It was a good model of doing that. Yeah. And I, I crave that kind of thing. Yeah. Think of like the number of people in this world who have not figured that out. <laughs> yeah. And Essie Hinton <laughs> is this teenager <laughs> who's figured it out, writes about a teenager who's figured it out. I'm glad it's required reading for, for, well, I guess it wasn't required for you. I think it was. I think it wasn't for the AP classes. I don't know. But yeah. in my AP classes, I think it was junior and senior year that people have read it probably. Mm. And I was not in those classes. But I think that's some people read it at my school. But I think that's, yeah, it's so beautiful. And it's a testament yeah. to, uh, I'm going to put a lot of weight on the fact that Essie Hinton was 16 years old, 14 years old I when she wrote this. can't get over it either. Yeah. Yeah. But like the fact that she, is able to reach these conclusions and like have this amount of empathy, it gives teenagers a lot more credit than we give them. I definitely think so. It is a testament to the fact that there's a lot of depth and, and we can hold teenagers to a higher standard in mm-hmm. terms of understanding human emotion. Yeah. We just have to give the opportunity and often teach them how about reading comprehension, but yeah, teenagers have the capacity they don't have to be a greaser or soched and like accidentally <laughs> kill each other <laughs> to to figure out all these lessons. Like they can read them from books. Yes. Uh, read yes. it from other teen other teen perspectives, from other teens. Uh yeah. What a I, good book. Ten out of ten. What did you Way think? Where you go, Essie Hinton? Where go? What was um what was your difference of opinion from reading it the first time to now? I think as an adult reading it made me appreciate it more. So like reading it as a kid, I don't remember much of my impression as a kid, except for the mm-hmm. shaving of the head and dyeing the hair blonde. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember why. Yeah. I'm trying to that figure out why that had such you. a, yeah. But, um, and then just remembering the name pony boy, <laughs> like, and like, that's a reference that's referenced throughout all of media. Like everywhere. everyone always says, yeah, mm-hmm. everywhere. It's like, stay, stay gold. gold. I know a Robert Frost poem now because of that, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> nothing gold can stay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't remember. I want to say I read this as a freshman in high school. Yeah, probably. I think so. I think that's the age that people do. But yeah, I don't remember much of it as a kid. Like, yeah, except for the stay gold pony boy. Yeah, yeah. It is an easy, like, yeah, what a great little nugget to take from the book. And, like, for not remember anything else about the book, yeah. but you always remember Stay Gold Pony Boy. Yeah. And I think that's just, like, the 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 whole moral of the, the book. Just stay yeah. gold. There's nothing – there's no point in getting into the ugliness of everything. Just – Stay Dewey romantic. Cannon. Yeah. Yeah. Notice the colors. Notice all uh-huh. the trees and what they look like. Yeah. Johnny that once said that he was like, before you, I didn't notice what colors everything was. You showed me, mm-hmm. like, before I you talked to me, I thought the world was black and white kind of thing. And yeah. that was so beautiful. Just, mm-hmm. oh, oh, that friendship. Was so sweet. So good. Greg, uh, and I probably attribute this to his height. <laughs> He's. <laughs> He's 6'4", but he always notices clouds. Oh, yeah. Uh, versus, well, like, when when I am walking, I I guess I notice the ground more because I'm like, I don't want to trip on anything. <laughs> yes. Um, Honestly. But it's beautiful having someone who notices the gold in the in the world. I agree. I agree. There's a, a sweet innocence about it that doesn't feel yeah. naive. But it feels like a choice. And I'm just also. looking for potholes. You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> just like, <laughs> Potholes, um, dog poop. I'm just like, yeah, I don't want to yeah. step in any of that. Why was it banned, do we think? I'm thinking the gang violence and smoking. Yeah, I think it was the like underage drinking and the gang violence. Yeah. But yeah. <sighs> so but, boring. Like, such a boring yeah. reason. <laughs> compared it's to such our a other boring. books. Come on. Come on. I know. Yeah. This <laughs> book was very tame compared to everything everything else we've read. Honestly. Honestly. Um, but still, um, ten out of ten. Ten out of ten. Ten out of ten. Tame doesn't mean bad. Okay, so 
<clears throat> it was mostly controversial at the time of its publication, but sure. it is still currently challenged and debated. It, it only says um, because of the portrayal of gang violence, underage smoking and drinking, strong language and slang, and family dysfunction, which is funny. <laughs> Oh my gosh. (laughs) If you banned anything because of family dysfunctions, like the whole family unit would be (laughs) banned, right? Yeah. And also, there's no family that actually functions perfectly. uh, Perfectly. Yeah. And that's why family, like the family unit is such a laboratory. It's where we learn how to love each other. Uh huh. No family unit is perfect. If it was, then like, I I don't know. I don't know. Show me one perfect family. Show me. Yeah. In, in the words of Robert Frost, nothing gold can stay. Like even <laughs> right. Like even no, if you true. if you, even if you intend to have like yeah to do everything perfectly, which what is perfect? Yeah. Yeah. Just like coming to terms with the fact that your kid is going to ha- be going to therapy in a couple years <laughs> <laughs> because well, of something you did. Yeah. And it's yeah. also like. We're not in control of how people react. We are, we can try to monitor our impact, obviously. But we're all Mm -hmm. human beings with different feelings, different hormones, different things going on. We're not always going to say the right thing. We're not always Mm going to respond accurately. We're not always going to be up to date on our sleep hours and whatnot. Like, it's not Uh going to be perfect, even if you're trying your hardest. And I just think to, to, to ban a book because family dysfunction. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Oh my goodness gracious. That makes me really sad because it's like family just dis- learning, reading family dysfunction is also how we learn mm-hmm. to be better. So, I mean, uh, Finding Nemo is all of, I'm thinking about like kids' media right now, like Finding Nemo's family dysfunction, like Snow White, overbearing father. Yeah. <laughs> right. Lion King, family I mean, dysfunction. Family dysfunction. <laughs> So that does get Mabel into bed because then she likes to pretend to be Scar. It's like, long live the king and like drop her stuffed animals. Stop. <laughs> That's what Mabel pretends. Oh my gosh. You're it's raising like, oh, a yeah. sociopath. I'm just like, Uncle Scar's a bad guy. <laughs> because you're calling him uncle scar that's yeah that's, that's how she too, that's how she refers to him <laughs> he's getting too familial with the villain in the family yeah it's like that's scar she's that like is, oh no that's that, that's uncle scar that is so <laughs> cute oh i can't wait to see her do that oh my gosh oh that's mm-hmm. so absurd though mabel you've gotta you've gotta you've gotta rein that in she needs to yeah. start trying to be more like <laughs> nala or simba or uh-huh. timon or pumba uh-huh <laughs> if all of us could be Tamar or Pumbaa. Oh, man. Okay. Mm-hmm. I need to go to yoga, but I love yes. this. Okay. Um, Let's say goodbye and I'll hit stop recording. Oh, good idea. Good yeah. Idea. Good idea. No, I'll just cut that part out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, sweet. Yeah. 10 out of 10 recommend The Outsiders. 10 out of 10. Okay. Farewell. Farewell, everybody. Right. Goodbye. Catch outsiders. you next time. If you haven't, it's a perfect winter read. It's a great winter it is. read. Great. Yes. Great, great. It's so good. It's so good. Okay. okay. Thank you, SEN. Bye. Bye. Burn This Book is produced by us, Nicola Corin and Eden Wen. Music by myself, Nicole, and performed by my dad, Frank. <laughs>